owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When he could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now, which one, uh, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then, she, then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, Cusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. The Gospel of the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Share God's peace by greeting those around you. All right, you may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Law and Gospel, that's the title of my sermon. Uh, and as I said, the law represents the demands of God. The Gospel represents the promises of God. Martin Luther believed, taught, that we encounter God's Word as both law and Gospel. In fact, he said, if you can discern the difference between law and gospel, you are a theologian. If you're not already a, a theologian, hopefully by the end of the sermon, you will be a theologian. You'll know the difference between law and gospel. Without the law, we cannot know the need of the gospel. The demands of God condemn us. And we realize we need, we need the mercy and grace of God. Without the gospel, the law can only kill. It kills, but then the gospel comes and raises us through God's love and mercy. Our world is in desperate need of hearing the gospel. Desperate. We had a visitor to the church on Thursday. And she came in and she said, uh, this might be a strange question. And I was in my office and heard what was going on. This might be a little bit of a strange question. 
but I want to know if I can come to this church. Now, I heard the answer, I don't know, you'll have to talk to the pastor. <laughs> but, and then, the, then there was a discussion about the difference between the Missouri Synod and the ELCA, which was irrelevant. Um, what she wanted to know was, if I come wearing blue jeans, will I be accepted? Or will people just stare at me and send me away? Will I be accepted? She wanted to hear the gospel. And she said, it's very important because it's not just for me. I'm going to bring my friend who has two teenage sons and her teenage sons need the church. Will we be accepted? And I said, uh, yes, you will. Especially if you come to the 11 o'clock service. You'll find people dressed just like you. Any of the services you will, but that one in particular. You see, the need. People feel the difference between law and gospel. And they need to hear the gospel. There's a lot of law in this text. Simon is really hammering this woman with the law. He's thinking in her heart, in his heart, these things. He's right, by the way. In Jesus' day, a woman, uh, he, he's saying only a sinner woman would let down her hair. What, it is, what is it about letting down hair? But in, in Jesus' day, women either had their hair up or they had it covered. If you let it down, that means there's something sensuous going on and that is not acceptable. Did they do that in the old time movies? A, a woman, if they uh, wanted to be attractive, they let down their hair? What's that all about? Anyway, Simon says, you let down your hair, they, they, only a sinner would do that. And then, a woman would never touch an unrelated male. She has to be a sinner. And then showing such a public, passionate display of affection. Now certainly, anything that public and passionate is, makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? If somebody came and started kissing my feet, you'd all have your mouths stuck open, wouldn't you? And I would too. Whoa! <laughs> What's going on? So Simon lays down the law in his mind. And then he even thinks to himself, he lays down the law about Jesus. He should know better. If he were a prophet, he would know better. The problem is, isn't it, with the law, is that it causes us to judge. Is it wrong to judge? We can't help it. In fact, that's how we exist in life, having good judgment and discernment about things. But to have the kind of judgment, the condemning judgment that Simon had, it only gets us into trouble. It isn't God's way at all. So Jesus, then he speaks, first he tells a parable about two debtors, one owing 500 denarii. A denarii is a day's wages. 500 denarii, 500 days wages. A debt almost impossible to pay back. And another has a pretty sizable debt, but only 50 days wages. 
They both have their debts forgiven. Jesus says, who will love more? And Simon says, well, probably the one who was forgiven the most. And Jesus says, rightly spoken. What Simon is betraying here is his limited knowledge. This woman who came and had this passionate display of affection for Jesus was forgiven much. Therefore, she was loving much. And we truly can't, and this is the problem with judgment, it assumes we know everything. Let me give you an example of judgment. In 1949, John Gurdon was in biology class. John Gurdon had a dream of becoming a scientist. And his biology teacher said, John, you will never become a scientist. You will never become a scientist because you cannot memorize the rudimentary facts of biology. John Gurdon remembered that. He never forgot it. Now, that may have been something, sometimes the law does this to us, that inspired him to work harder and remember those rudimentary facts of biology. But it's staying, and it stayed with him. And until 2012, he received the Nobel Prize for medicine. He found that uh, mature molecules in the body could be reprogrammed to be plura potent. They could become uh, cells for other organs. But just think, if that law hit him in a different way, it was just words of condemnation, his dream of becoming a scientist may have died at that moment. We don't know everything there is to know. So we need to be careful about our judgment. Now Jesus law, lays down the law to Simon. He says, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet. And this woman has been cleaning my feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair. See what Jesus is condemning Simon now for? His terrible sin. His lack of hospitality. And it shows us that if we are going to ever judge someone, you better do so from the standpoint of humility, the standpoint of recognizing your own sin. He said, Simon, when I entered your house, you invite me to your house. Did you really want me here? You didn't kiss me when I entered. This woman has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't come and provide oil for my hair. What kind of host are you? This woman has anointed my feet with ointment. So Simon thinks he hammered the woman. Jesus now turns the law on him and says, you don't measure up, Simon. Wow, Jesus really zings Simon, says Ted. And Rick says, yeah. He does it out of love. Jesus loves us so much he even pays attention to our failures. Of course, Ted, well, with friends like that, Rick says, don't go there. I enjoyed it anyway. So don't lose sight of your own imperfections. We do so so easily. 
C.S. Lewis, one of the great lay theologians of the past century, wrote, he was talking about applying the Word of God to the lives of other people. He wrote this, Unfortunately, we enjoy thinking about other people's faults and in the proper sense of the word, morbid. That is the most morbid pleasure in the world. And while we are governed by this vice, there can be no heaven for you, just as there can be no sweet smells for a man with a cold in the nose and no music for a man who is deaf. It's not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us there is something growing up which will of itself be hell unless it's nipped in the bud. Judgment that's not tempered by us realizing our own imperfections and faults. Judgment that doesn't try to understand and see the big picture. That kind of judgment only brings hell into our lives. On the other hand, I used this illustration at yesterday's funeral. Antony Scalia said, uh, Supreme Court Justice, when he was at Lewis Powell's funeral, Lewis Powell was a very good man. And he complimented the pastor. He sent him this note that said in part, when the deceased man was an admirable person, indeed, especially when the deceased was, was an admirable person, praise for his or her virtues can cause us to forget what we are praying for and what we are giving thanks for. We're thanking. We're thankful for God's inexplicable mercy to a sinner. What are we here for? To hear about God's inexplicable mercy to you and I. It's like the old story. Didn't you, kids always tell you this, when you pointed your finger at them, you always have three pointing back at yourself. You need to remember ourselves and our own imperfections and realize that we need God's inexplicable mercy. It's a poem that was written by Mary Rita Shilke Karazam when you thought I wasn't looking. And it talks about how people do look and there's certain judgments that, make, that, that are made and often good judgments. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you hang my first painting on the refrigerator. And I wanted to paint another one. And sometimes those pictures we hang on the refrigerator by our ch children and grandchildren, that's a real act of grace, isn't it? Put it on the re refrigerator. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you feed a stray cat, and I thought it was good to be kind to animals. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you make my favorite cake for me. And I knew that little things are special things. When you thought I wasn't looking, I heard you say a prayer. And I believed that there was a God to talk to. When you thought I wasn't looking, I felt you kiss me goodnight and I felt loved. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw tears come from your eyes, and I learned that sometimes things hurt, but it is all right to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you cared, and I wanted to be everything that I could be. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked, and I wanted to say thanks for all the things I saw when you thought I wasn't looking. Well, in the church, do you have, ever have prayers for your congregation? That we would be and grow and always be greater than we are today. And maybe our prayer would be include these things 
a hope that people would see something in us when we think they are not looking. When you thought I wasn't looking, you welcomed me in my blue jeans and or my tattoos. In this political climate, just think we have two candidates running for president that in the popularity polls are way down. So much contention, even among church members, contention about our politics. So, when you thought I wasn't looking, we saw that people of faith can accept each other and respect those with whom they disagree. When you thought I wasn't looking, we saw you go out of your way to welcome me with all of my differences and showed me that church is a place of inclusion and belonging. When you thought we weren't looking, we watched you accept the poor ones, the struggling ones, and we knew God's love is alive. When you thought that we weren't looking, we saw you pray, even for people you didn't know. And we saw that prayer, we saw that faith unites us, not divides us. So yes, we come today, we hear God's word, both God's demands, but most importantly, we hear the gospel, God's inexplicable mercy to sinners. Amen. rise and sing as we share tithes and offerings.
Gracious God, you are the God of new life. Bring newcomers, visitors, and seekers into this church. Give us welcoming hearts open to new perspectives and gifts that they bring. Lord, in your mercy. God of all that is, we encounter you not only in the grandeur of your creation, but in its smallest and quietest parts. Awaken us to your presence all around us. Lord, in your mercy. God of power and might, call the nations of the world to recognize first your authority and justice. Today, as we remember Jesus forgiving a woman judged a sinner, we pray that you reach out to protect and rescue the child brides in so many Asian, Middle Eastern, and African cultures. We continue to remember all the girls enslaved by ISIS, the boys forced into becoming soldiers and often to commit atrocities. We pray for those seeking to rescue them, that they be enabled to do so speedily and safely. We pray too for their home communities to accept and love them on their return. Lord, in your mercy, God of healing and help, send your healing presence to those who are ill, especially Larry Carlson, Terry Carlson, Pam Cole, Lyle and Lucy Dolly, Sandy Drake, Daniel Everett, Ron Fells, Ron Hover, David Jones, Jeff Hempfell, David Kamens, Vera Kimsey, Ellen Lassant, Paula Merkley, Chris Marquardt, Willis Melgren, Eddie Miner, Gail Moffat, Norma Mueller, Carolyn Nyes, Lynn Peterson, Benita Stamper, Lucy Stillwell, Rod Thurman, and Linnea Ugla. Are there any others? Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you let your loving and compassionate arms hold all who have died in your eternal life. Comfort those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Jane Crisman. Lord, in your mercy. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me.
Remembering therefore his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Today we commune via intinction, which means we receive the bread or a wafer in your hand, hold it until the chalice comes along and dip or intinct it into the chalice. Our Lord invites us. All are welcome. Please come. You may be seated.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, through the gifts of his body and blood, strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you for this gift of life. We thank you that you draw, draw us close to your heart. You help us know that we are forgiven, loved, cared for by you. With that love, help us to leave this place inspired to spread your love and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Oh, yeah.